Welcome. It is Tuesday, June 30th, 2020. And this past Sunday, I shared some thoughts with uh, the prayer community that uh, my wife and I lead, uh, the Azusa House of Prayer here in Azusa, California. And it was in response to the continual questions I'm asked with regard to where are we today with regard to the Bible? And I want to start by saying this flatly. I'm not asking anyone uh, to blindly accept what I'm going to say, what I'm going to teach. I urge everyone to boldly uh, challenge all the ideas you hear from me. Uh, refuse any that you cannot substantiate in this book. Um, I urge everyone who is watching uh, to be like the Bereans. In Acts 17 it tells us that um, they receive the word with great eagerness, examining scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so I encourage you, I prayerfully ask you to check everything against the word of God. This past week, um, the last week in June, um, my wife received a text from a friend that uh, referred us to um, a website with a discussion between um, a woman in the U.S. and a couple in Israel who are Messianic believers. And to compact what that was about, um, they were saying in that that there, uh, our president is no longer in control of our government, that there are actually six men over them, over him, um, and these men are um, a half part alien, and they go to Matthew 25 and then to Genesis 6 and try to blend together the days of Noah in Matthew 25 and uh, the sons of God taking uh, the women of men and having offspring, the Nephilim, and that the Nephilim are, are returning and the Nephilim are, are coming back to be a part of the end times picture. That's just one of the alarming things that was said in that. What, uh, what captured me was uh, these three people present themselves as true believers of Jesus Christ and, and it's not my position to judge that. Um, they could actually be my brothers and, and sisters in Christ. Um, but because they set the platform, they began by saying, we are believers, we are advocates for what's happening in the end times. Because they use that as the launch pad, somebody who doesn't know what the Bible says could listen to that entire hour long discussion and believe it. And so I sent uh, some points back to the friend who sent us this, this video. Um, someone that has been a, uh, a strong intercessor in the last 20 years or so that we've had relationship. And uh, basically said in response to my points, well, thank you for your opinion, but I believe this is true. That was uh, mind boggling to me. And in response to that, I felt like I needed to go to scripture and present what the Bible says uh, about the end times. With that said, I'm not gonna talk about Matthew 25 today. I'm not gonna talk about Genesis 6. I will probably talk about that next week because it's still the parable of the fig tree and the end of uh, uh, Matthew 24, I'm sorry, not Matthew 25, the end of Matthew 24, uh, is very clear about what Jesus is saying for the day and the hour in which we live. But today I, I wanna look at Matthew 24, parts of it, uh, parts of Mark 13 and parts of Luke 21, and how they pertain to uh, what's called the beginning of sorrows in some translations, or the beginning of birth pangs. So, I believe that I am a part of the final generation of natural history. Whether I will live out my life through all of this, 
uh, I'm uncertain. But there's two questions that people ask when I say that, and they should ask. Number one, how can we know if we're living in that generation? Um, and how will we know if it is the last generation? And if we look at generations in scripture, uh, generally there are three spans of time that are called generations in the Bible. Uh, there's a 30 year span called generation, a 40 year span called generation, and a 100 year span called generation. Um, I believe this generation that we are in, uh, which I believe is the last generation, uh, began in 1948 when Israel became a nation. Um, everything subsequent to that has been the process of God fulfilling His Word and uh, Jesus preparing uh, to come for His bride. And, uh, and what are the signs? And the good news is there is a lot of information in the Bible about this and most of the information that I'm sharing today um, are the words of Jesus. And so um, Jesus would not tell us in response to his disciples asking the question, uh, what signs should we look for? Jesus wouldn't give us specific signs to look for, circumstances around his coming, and then suddenly say, well, I don't want anybody to know when I'm coming back. So he made it pretty clear that he wanted those in this last generation, this final generation, to have understanding of the signs and the seasons and the time that we're in and as a preparation for what's coming. Um, so this prophetic time frame in the end of times, the beginning of birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows, um, it leads up to the final seven years, which in those final seven years, known as the tribulation, is divided in two sectors. The first three and a half years um, of a counterfeit world peace, and the second three and a half years of great tribulation, particularly persecution of the saints uh, by the Antichrist and um, the attempted annihilation of Israel by the kings of the earth. Um, so the baby that is birthed, I believe out of these birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows, um, is an end time harvest of souls. Um, a purifying of the church, and, and I'll talk about that in here a little bit, and the return of Jesus to rule and fill the earth with God's glory uh, in a millennial kingdom that precedes a new heaven and a new earth. And, and I'm not going to talk about those things today. Today I'm, I'm particularly talking about um, the signs of the times and the day and the hour that we are in right now. Um, this time of, of world peace, of, of counterfeit world peace and safety, is coming. And uh, Paul, when he writes to the church at Thessalonica in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, says, when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction, which I believe is the Great Tribulation, comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And then the prophet Daniel, says this in Daniel 9:27. then he, meaning the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, and that includes nations, which includes Israel, um, for one week or seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he shall bring an end of the sacrifices in the temple. And again, that's, that's another teaching, but I share those to let you know that the Bible says those, those days are coming. Um, and it's gonna be just, uh, you know, before this, this third time frame, the, the beginning of sorrows, the first half of, of fake peace and safety, and the second half of tribulation, that this takes place. Haggai pro prophesied this, and in Haggai 2, verses 6 and 7, and verse 22, he says, uh, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea, the dry land. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, who is Jesus and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. So these, these six things that the prophet speaks that are coming um, at the end, a shaking of the heavens, the sky, the earth, the sea, dry land, vegetation, all nations, 
and he's going to shake the nations in such a way that it will destroy the strength of Gentile rulers, of Gentile kings. So as I read Matthew 24, as I read uh, Mark uh, chapter uh, 13, and as I read Luke 21, um, all three of these followers of Jesus are uh, pinning their uh, recollection of the conversation Jesus had with them about how they would know uh, the, the end of the age was near. And so there are uh, 15 uh, sorrows or birth pangs uh, that Jesus talks about in these uh, three passages. Jesus identifies um, 10 convergences, and I call them convergences because of this. These 10 points that we're going to talk about, um, they're not sequential, um, they're not systematic, they are um, random, chaotic, happening at different times within the same time span, but eventually converging together to this one big event that will propagate um, an antichrist to come and to offer a plan to bring a, a one world economy, a one world government, a one world religion, and it will be uh, called world peace. And so um, these, these 10 convergences and then these five trends, after these 10 convergences, there's five trends in these seven years um, that, that are going to escalate. And so um, most of these, and there are positive trends. I don't want it to sound all negative, and I, and I will share the positive. Uh, but most of the positive and negative trends that come in the fullness of time of Jesus' return, I believe. And again, you're, please challenge me if you feel compelled to do so. But I feel scripture says they have begun now and these will continue to increase until Jesus returns. Um, and so we resist these negative sign convergences by prayer and uh, praying uh, for mercy for those affected by them. You know, in Jesus' conversations with his disciples, um, there are times they ask questions, like why couldn't they cast out demons? This that we're talking about here in, in, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, they're asking how will we know the signs of the end of the age? They also, and we have it recorded in Luke and Matthew, ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And you know, he never, uh, they never asked him to teach them how to teach or how to be a good leader um, or, or how to uh, do the things that Jesus did. Now they said, uh, teach us how to pray. Prayer is this incredibly powerful weapon God has entrusted to us. Paul tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, they're not flesh and blood, but they're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. And again, a whole different teaching, a whole different conversation. But I just want you to understand the way our response in these uh, convergences is not fear. Um, we, we are standing on a foundation. As followers of Jesus Christ, we stand on a foundation that cannot be shaken. So, so fear is not uh, the motivation of this. The, the, the issue is for us to pray through what we are involved in, to see God's kingdom come and His will be done in fullness in the earth in the day of the return of the king. So as we look at these um, convergences, I want us to, to understand uh, why I say um, I think this is the generation. Uh, in Luke 21, Jesus is speaking in verse 28 and verse 32. This is what he says. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your head because your redemption is drawing near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. And he's not talking about the generation 
um, when he's speaking to the disciples, he's talking about the generation when all of these events begin to converge and converge in this great catastrophic event that brings about false peace and safety and sets up what, what we call uh, the tribulation period, seven years. Um, and, and we're going to find as the end grows near, these events are going to accelerate and be repeated over and over again. Um, he doesn't each say each one of these things is singular. That they are multiplied in different arenas, in different intensities, and they are happening all over the earth. And uh, so these, these uh, 10 convergences he calls uh, the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of birth pangs. And I want to read to you uh, how Matthew records it, how Mark records it, and how Luke records it. And so in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8, uh, Jesus' response to the question, how will we know? What are the signs we look for for, for your return? Uh, Jesus says, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See, you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Or in the New King James, it says the beginning of sorrows. In Mark 13, verses 5 through 8, again, Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Or again, New King James says, these are the beginning of sorrows. And then finally, Luke records it in Luke 21 verses 8 through 11 and verse 25, he says this, And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. Again, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, not nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So what are these 10 convergences that Jesus identifies in these three uh, passages, which are all the same passage or, this, or the same description of a conversation written by three different men? He said there's going to be deception and false Christ. Number one, there's going to be wars, military and political conflict. Uh, there's going to be ethnic conflict, civil disorder, racism, nations rising against nations, economic warfare, economic uh, related to hostility, aggression, and conflict. There's going to be famines, pestilence, great earthquakes, commotions, fearful sights as great signs from the heavens, and perplexity at the roaring of the sea. So, uh, and Jesus identified five trends after all this takes place, and I believe these trends are enacted in the midst of a false peace and safety. Um, and this is what he says in Matthew 24, verses 9 through 12. Um, he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended, they will betray one another, they will hate one another, the many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. There's eight wills in that passage. 
And, and, and we need to be very mindful of that because Jesus didn't say might, he didn't say bay, he said didn't say could, he said these things will happen. And so he's very clear, he's very succinct in what he tells them is coming. And so in that passage, there's five things. There's an increase of persecution, there's social anarchy, there are false prophets, lawlessness is going to abound, and the love of many, and, and in that context, um, it's love on many levels. It's, it's love of uh, the brethren in the church, love of God, uh, love of family members. Uh, so in the beginning of birth pangs and sorrows, these 10 convergences, uh, they're not sequential, but they are converging together. The first one, we saw in Matthew 24, 5 and Mark 13, 6. That's deception and false Christs. Um, it, it's also there in, in Luke. Um, all three accounts, uh, and that was in uh, Luke 21, 8. It's interesting to me that all three of these men, when they write the account of what Jesus says is going to happen, they all verbatim quote what is being said uh, by Jesus with regard to many see that you are not led astray for many will come in my name saying I am he uh, and these who claim to be one of God's anointed now <clears throat> saying that I am the Christ. That word there is not, that there's a, not a deity attached to that word that Jesus uses Christ. It actually means anointed ones. And so what he's saying is there are gonna come many who people believe are anointed to teach the word of God, who are anointed leaders within the church, uh, within the realm of um, a relationship with Jesus as we know it. And so um, these many include political leaders, military leaders, um, all kinds of, of leaders. Uh, some leaders are, are going to gain large followings because it says many. It doesn't say a few. It says many uh, will be deceived and led astray. <clears throat> Jesus warned more about deception than anything else related to the end times. And understand this about deception. I want to go back to the story I told you at the beginning about this video clip that I watched. The reason people are going to accept this entire uh, theory that they have, and they're using the Bible to support it, is because they are using truth about salvation and about being followers of Jesus. So understand deception will always have truth mixed in with it. Otherwise, you won't be deceived. There has to be something that you believe in, something that you hold true to your relationship with Jesus and, the, and, and relationship to his return in these deceptions. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're going to identify it right off and to say, that's, that's idiocy. And so listen, in, in, in and I've read these verses, but I want to read them again. In Matthew 24, 4 and 5, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. They are going to deceive many. In verse 11, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And, and the key word here is when you look at prophets, it's not prophecies, it's, it's prophets. There are going to be people who come and say that they are prophets of God. And it's going to be much as it was with Israel during the time of Jeremiah. That every time Jeremiah prophesied what God was going to do with the children of Israel, the king would call for another prophet to prophesy good. And the people chose to believe the false prophet over the true prophet of God. And that is what's going to happen in this generation, in this situation. There are going to be prophets that are going to come and, and tell you not to listen to what anointed, really anointed men and women of God are saying about the return of the king and about what's coming for the church. They're going to say, no, that's, that's not true. And people will believe them because people want to believe 
people want to embrace whatever is easy. Jesus said there's a, a, a wide gate that leads to a wide road and many will find it. And there is a narrow gate that leads to a narrow, ro narrow road and few will find it. So part of the deception uh, is that many are going to choose the wide gate and the wide road. And so he says <clears throat> in uh, Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus says, look, it, it's, there's even going to be supernatural attached to it. And, and we should not... We should not be uh, shocked by that. If, if you remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and he took his staff and he threw it down to show he had authority from God when his staff, staff turned into a serpent, the, the soothsayers uh, for Pharaoh took their staff and threw it down and it became a snake as well. But then Moses' staff or snake swallowed their snake. So we shouldn't be shocked or surprised that there are going to be false signs and wonders that appear to be true signs and wonders because again, if we know it's a lie, we're not going to follow it. It's going to have some form of truth in it. The fact that it's a miracle, people are going to follow the miracle and then listen to the teachings or the instructions of these false leaders and be deceived and follow after them. And finally, in, in Mark 13, verse 6, Jesus says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. So the number one convergence, deception and false Christs. Be alert. If you know this book, and, and you know what's written in the pages, and you know what the Holy Spirit's teaching us, and you are part of a community that holds each other accountable and prayerfully considers and walks through this, you have less chance to be deceived than if you simply are listening for someone to say what you want to hear. <clears throat> so, convergence number two, wars, military and political conflicts. And I think oftentimes when we think of wars, we think of weapons, we think of shooting guns and bombs. But we are seeing a war in our nation right now between two sides. Um, those who identify as Republican and those who identify as Democrat. And there is a war for the heart of our nation that is being waged right now. And the weapons are words and the weapons are deception. And we need to remember that uh, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, old things passed away, all things become new. Our identity is no longer in the earthly realm. Our identity is in Christ. Uh, he says, uh, the scripture says that we are aliens. Uh, we are strangers, we're not of this world. And so we gotta make sure that as believers, we don't get sucked into political debates that keep people from understanding what the Bible says. And I'm not gonna get into all of this that's going on right now with the accusations and discussions of racism. I'm a child of the King. Um, the Bible tells me that by the spirit of adoption, I am able to call God Abba, Daddy. The Bible tells me that I, as a believer, am seated at the right hand of God with Jesus as a co-heir, a co-equal. If I'm a co-heir, that means the inheritance that God has set aside for Jesus becomes the inheritance of his other sons and daughters as well. And in that relationship through Jesus of salvation that we have in our relationship with God, Psalm 2, tells us part of the inheritance of Jesus, uh, that, that prophetic psalm that says, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. So all of that is coming. All of that is our identity. So when I talk about wars and rumors of wars, I'm talking about wars on every level uh, with weapons, with you know bullets and bombs that kill people, 
with politics and lies and deceptions that are also also being used to discredit and kill people's reputations and to kill people's livelihood and, and so many other things. But, you know, since World War II, as far as wars with guns and, and that, there have been over 150 major wars that have occurred on the planet. And, uh, you know, the count tells us that over 25 million people have died since World War II globally uh, because of wars. Um, since the Berlin Wall came down, which was the ending of, of communism uh, as displayed in the world and where East and West Germany were joined, became a united Germany. Uh, since that wall came down in 1989, um, conflicts have forced over 50 million people globally to lose their homes, to, to have to flee their homes. Um, you know, in, in uh, 1993, there, there were 29 wars in one year. Um, you know, there have always been wars. Uh, and now we have the wars of politics, we have the wars of uh, biological warfare, germ warfare. So all of these things, we need to be mindful. Jesus said, this is going to happen. And, and, and the reason I want to emphasize that is there's a tendency in some, as believers, to pray against these things happening, to pray against wars, uh, to pray against deceptions of all Christ. Um, but Jesus said these things must happen. So why are we praying against what Jesus says have to happen? Our prayer should not be against it. Our prayer should be, don't let us become victim of it and pray for those around us to also stand in this day and this hour. The things in, in Ephesians 6, when Paul talks about you know, uh, the, the weapons, you know, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Over and over and over again, his, his call is to stand. He says, stand, stand, stand. And so we have to stand in this day and this hour. We can't get away and fearfully pray for God to end what's happening because he said in his word, these things have to happen. And when they do happen, the end hasn't come yet. There's more that will follow, which is the tribulation. But so we have to be mindful of that. The third thing is civil disorder. Racism, genocide. Um, you know, this, this, the Greek word for nations is, is uh, ethnos, and uh, which we translate, translate as ethnic or as tribal. Um, so ethnic wars are even going on now. The ethnic wars at the killing fields of Cambodia, um, Sunni and Shia ethnic wars going on in the Middle East, uh, Rwanda, Bosnia, uh, Kosovo, Sudan. These are ethnic wars. Th these are one group of people trying to, to eradicate another group of people simply because of their religious or, or ethnic beliefs. All of the Muslims of the Middle East um, feel like they need to eradicate Israel and everybody who's Jewish. Uh, need to wipe out, you know, they say they won't rest until Israel is removed from the face of the earth. And now they've included the United States in that statement as well. So, you know, ethnic conflict or civil disorder fueled by racism is continuing making the world headlines. We are in a time like that in our nation right now. Um, and the 20th century, we're in the 21st century now, but the 20th century, gained, you know, claimed more lives in wars and, and disorders and racisms and genocides than all other wars combined. When you look at Sudan, two million people. Uh, you look at Ethiopia, a million. Uganda, 550,000. Nigeria, a million. North Korea, they say two million, but we don't know because they never tell the truth anyway. Afghans, 800,000. Chinese, 35 million. Indonesia, 500,000. Bosnia, 200,000, Rwanda, 800,000, Russia, 15 million, Cambodia, 2 million, the Nazis, 6 million, the rape of Nanking. Um, Nanking in the 30s was the, the capital of China. And it's hard for us to imagine or wrap our, eye, our brain around this, but historically, 
Japan had invaded China and was taking control of China. Little Japan was invading China and they felt the best way to take control was to destroy Nanking, which was the capital. And so they went in and they killed 150,000 soldiers, murdered them. They didn't kill them in battle. They gathered them up and murdered them. They killed another 50,000 men and they raped, mutilated and tortured over 20,000 girls and women. And then they burned the city to the ground. That happened between 1937 and 1939, 1938. Uh, Stalin's forced famine, and, and again, I don't want to get into the history, but you read the history of Stalin. He forced a famine in Russia uh, and killed seven million people. Uh, the Armenians in Turkey and the way they were treated. So ethnic cleansing, these types of things have been going on and they're going to continue. Uh, the convergence, and again, it's happened, most of this has happened in the 20th century. A, bit, a large part of it happened after Israel became a nation, and, and that's why I believe that that's the generation Jesus is talking about, because all these things have been taking place since then. Um, uh, economic warfare, convergence number four. Um, this is uh, using economics for aggression, for hostility, uh, for conflict. Uh, to make war in the area of natural resources. Um, the greatest power that a government inflicts upon its people to control its people is financial. Um, whether it is uh, making sure there's not enough food uh, or making sure there's not enough water, all of that has a financial uh, structure to it. So economic warfare can devastate a nation. I was in um, in, in South America back in the 80s as an engineer uh, working on a large uh, project in uh, Venezuela, in Caracas. And when I was there, I actually did two large projects there. While I was there, the economy of that nation was incredible. Uh, it was one of the, it was the richest nation in South America. It was part of OPEC. And, and so I was, I was there in 1988. Where they have gone from 1988 to where they are today is the, the complete result of forced um, economic uh, withholding for the upper echelon to control all the money and to have all the wealth and to starve everybody else. Famines and massive food shortages, the convergence number five that, you know, um, nearly a billion people uh, worldwide suffer today, today, 2020, for malnutrition. Um, and they project that that number of malnourished uh, citizens on Earth will double by 2025. So in five years, they estimate that there will be two billion people suffering malnutrition because of coming famines. Um, over 25,000 people die every day uh, from hunger-related causes. Uh, nearly 5 million die of starvation every year. Famine in Ethiopia and Sudan, we see those pictures and those commercials all the time. They're in the headlines regularly. Um, over 500 million people on the planet right now don't have enough clean drinking water, which leads to all sorts of things. They can't grow crops, they get diseases because they drink dirty water. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and what we've experienced up till now is nothing compared to what's coming, according to Jesus. Convergence number six is pestilence, disease, uh, COVID-19, and need, need I say anything else? Um, experts warn that one of the greatest threats in the world today is biological warfare. Because once it is launched, if it's launched on a magnitude, <clears throat> that it could be launched. Uh, there's no stopping it. There is no recourse. People are just going to suffer and die without any retaliation. <clears throat> Earthquakes. I live in California. 
Um, I've experienced many earthquakes. They tell us there are probably a thousand tremors that take place in our state every day. So when it says earthquakes, great earthquakes, Luke says, um, it's not talking about quantity. Earthquakes have always been with it. He's talking about magnitude and level of destruction. What we saw in Mexico uh, last week, again, is just a little, a little picture. And, and, and we'll look at it again here in, in, in point number 10, Convergence 10. But earthquakes, earthquakes can shift a global mood drastically. An earthquake, a massive, massive earthquake, the big one that they're telling us we always prepare for in Southern California, uh, could destroy our economy, could destroy everything. So these earthquakes have a, have a global effect. If the economy of Southern California were to collapse because of an earthquake, uh, California has the ninth largest economy in the world. Uh, all countries, but all the countries in there, California has the ninth largest economy. If the ninth largest economy in the world collapses, uh, the, the largest provider of produce and food in America is California. So th there's a lot that could happen from an earthquake. Um, convergence number eight is commotions, these chaotic events in society. I want to read again Luke 21 9 because he says it this way, when you hear of wars and disturbances, um, Mark and, and Matthew say wars and rumors of wars, but, but Luke says, wars and disturbances, don't be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. It's uncertain what everything included in this convergence. Um, but many different activities could fit into this. What we have seen happen in the U.S., and it's happening in other nations as well, um, the fact that they're trying to eradicate history, trying to remove history by removing monuments and statues and changing flags and, and changing songs, um, all of this are disturbances. Um, the, 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 the BLM, the, the, uh, the Marxist side of that movement, uh, Antifa, these are certainly signs of commotions and disturbances. Um, but what's interesting is that um, many Bibles translate this word disturbance difference, many, many translations. I just want to read these to you just to get the understanding of, of what is Jesus is saying here. Um, in the King James, the New King James in the Berean literal Bible, it says it's translated commotions. Uh, in the NIV and Young's literal translation, it's translated uprising. In the New English translation and the Berean Study Bible, it's translated rebellion. In the NIV and, and Young's, it's, it's uprisings. In the ESV and the ASV, it's tumults. In the New American Standard, it's, it's disturbances. Uh, in the International Standard Version, it is revolutions. In the New Living Translation, it's insurrections. So for the word disturbance, we have commotions, uprising, rebellions, tumults, disturbances, revolutions, and insurrections. The bottom line is it's going to be a mess. It is going to be a, uh, a global mess, a cultural mess. And militant um, Islamic leaders have, have targeted the U.S and Israel and the European Union to bring about this commotion and chaos, escalation and border disputes. So all of this again is everything working together to come to this massive convergence to where the, the culmination is going to be something that is going to allow the leaders of the world to embrace a one world leader. Convergence number nine is this. Fearful sights as great signs from the heaven, Luke 21. This word fearful in, in the Greek uh, comes from the root word phobos, which is where we get our, our word phobia, which is another word for fear. Um, you know, people have all kinds of, 
We have agoraphobia, people who are afraid of open spaces. We have arachnophobia, people who are afraid of spiders. Um, and there are all kinds of phobias, and people who have these phobias are terrified by them. Um, and so these, these fearful sights, it's terrorized happenings that cause our heart to faint with fear. Now look at the Holocaust, I believe, was, for no better word, the cliff notes for us to see a picture of what is going to be global. What happened within the realm of Europe, most of the World War II affected Europe. Um, what the Nazis did, what Mussolini did, what Stalin did, uh, that all happened in Europe and, and they all, all hated Jews. In fact, unfortunately, even the leaders in our country at that time were anti-Semitic. Um, it wasn't until Harry Truman came on the scene and, and cast the, the, the deciding vote for Israel to be recognized as a nation and to get its land back. And so in this, uh, this, this escalation of border disputes and, show, and this, this fear, the Holocaust, the fear that America had when we saw airplanes fly into the Twin Towers, um, when we saw what happened to people, the devastation, um, the expression of injustice in our land right now with intolerance and perversion and uh, there's just all kinds of things going on. And Revelation 16 uh, talks about even more. Uh, you read Revelation 16, it talks about sea and fresh water turning to blood. It talks about the sun scorching people. It talks about darkness covering the entire earth. Talking about people who are in such pain that they're gnawing, they're chewing on their tongues because of the pain. So yes, the, the, the worst is yet to come. But our, our hope is not in man, is not in solutions. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in the King of Kings. Conversions number 10 is perplexity at the roaring of the sea, Luke 21. Um, it's interesting. English translations of this phrase vary as well. So, um, in the New American Standard, NIV, ESV, ASV, NLT, New King James, it says, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Um, the Holman Christian translation says, nations bewildered by the roaring of the seas and waves. Um, the International Standard Version says that uh, people are confused, nations are confused by the roaring of the sea and its waves. The New English Translation says people are anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging waves. Now let's go back to the earthquakes. Um, we know that when earthquakes take place in the ocean of great magnitude, what follows are tsunamis, waves that will completely swallow up an entire country. So part of what we could be reading about here, because this talks about nations, uh, nations are being, are, are perplexed, are bewildered, are confused, and are anxious. So there could be massive tidal waves, these huge earthquakes taking place not on land but in the ocean, causing great, I mean also on land but in the ocean as well, causing great tidal waves which brings this crashing of the waves, so much so you can't stop a tsunami. You, you, you can't save people from a tsunami. When it starts, all you can do is try and save yourself or your immediate family. So we see these convergences, and they're still coming. They're, 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 they're increasing in frequency. They're increasing in magnitude. And so we need to be watchful and mindful. So everything that's taking place right now is a part of what Jesus told his disciples would take place, things that must happen, but it's not the end yet. Then we have these final seven years and these five trends that Jesus talks about. Uh, Matthew, uh, you know, the number one is persecution and hatred of believers. Christians don't like to talk about that. Uh, people in the church um, don't like to talk about that. There are many who want to believe that mm, somehow we're going to escape persecution, that somehow we are God's absolute favorite, 
And even though we've had brothers and sisters throughout the centuries, even today as we speak, who are losing their lives, their homes, family members, for the sake of the gospel, somehow we want to believe that we're going to escape it. But Jesus said we're not. He says they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Let me, let me tell you, <clears throat> and again, when the first three and a half years ends, according to Daniel, there is this abomination of desolation. And all of a sudden, the sacrifices in the temple cease. And it tells us this, in a nutshell, that at that time, the kings of the earth, so the kings of the earth are organizations, are, are nations that have presidents or have you know, kings or, or prime ministers, they are going to come together with one goal, remove the history, annihilate Israel, remove Israel from the earth. It talks about that the kings of the earth coming against Israel. But it also says the Antichrist, while they're doing that, the Antichrist is going to be pursuing the saints. And the reason he pursues the saints is because we are the only ones who are proclaiming the truth, the only ones that have the power and authority, and the only ones who know everything that's false. And so that, that, that persecution and hatred of believers is coming. The second thing is this, this um, social anarchy. You know, Luke 24, 10 says that many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. The social order is going to be filled with offense. Um, hate is going to dominate society. Um, you know, how did the KGB and the Gestapo seduce informants to betray family members? If you study World War II, most of the cities in Europe, there weren't enough soldiers to police the cities because they had to fight the wars they would recruit local citizens to betray other citizens and to be the eyes and the ears for the KGB or for the Gestapo. And then they in turn would turn family members in, friends in, neighbors in, and, and they would get a, a, a kind of reward for that. And so how were they able to do that? It's going to happen on a greater magnitude now. We see even now because of politics in our nation, families divided. Um, families that um, will say they are followers of Jesus and they can be divided, uh, vehemently divided over what's going on. So there's going to be relational breakdowns in society that are not going to make headlines. It's all happening even now. And after people begin to hate family members because of their faith, that's a big part of the persecution. They're going to hate family members because of their faith. They will lose their bearings. Um, and so, and, and this isn't referring specifically to hatred of believers because there are going to be people who aren't believers who are still good people who are going to refuse to go along. Um, there are a lot of people that saved Jews in the Holocaust that weren't believers in Jesus. They were probably even atheists but they were good people and they suffered the cons consequence. And so they're gonna hate anybody who defends or stands with uh, freedom of religion. Uh, the third trend is gonna be deception of false prophets. Uh, and again, many false prophets, many false prophets. Um, and this, this great falling away that's gonna take place at the end of the age. Uh, listen to what Paul and Peter say. Paul, when he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So again, when the Antichrist shows up, Paul says, there's gonna be deception because of apostasy, this great falling away. When he writes to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy 4, he says, but the Spirit explicitly says, in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits 
and the doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. So people are going to embrace false doctrines to such an extent that, you know, a branding iron, when somebody takes a branding iron and brands an animal or brands a human, there's nothing you can ever do to remove that brand. It is seared in, it is there forever. And Paul says the deception is gonna be so great that the false things they believe, the spirits, deceitful spirits and these doctrines they believe are gonna be seared, seared into their heads, seared into their spirits um, like a branding iron. He also writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy that uh, in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Again, he says to Timothy, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things. See, it's coming. It's all the way back in the days of, of the apostles. They warned of this day at the end that would come. And every generation has, to some extent, uh, believed Jesus was coming in their generation. So we could take this and apply it to every generation throughout history. Um, and you know, if, if generations are 100 years long, uh, we're, we're only in the 21st century, you know, uh, of when Jesus was here. And so then Peter says this, but false prophets are also among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned, and in their great greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. The fourth trend is lawlessness lawlessness abounding and because of this lawlessness the love of many will grow cold paul spoke about a seared conscious conscience in the end times that i just talked about the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience with a branding iron this includes people being given over to sin Paul when he writes to the church at Rome in, in, in Romans chapter 1 verses 24 through 28. I'm not going to read it all here, but he starts by, by stating this in verse 24 of Romans 1. Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity. That's, that's what's coming. Many will be given over to a spirit of delusion as global blasphemy of the spirit occurs. Um, sin is going to reach its full expression. Um, you know, the increased evil as a prophetic sign is humans reach the highest potential of evil. Understand, it is going to be people doing this to people, motivated by the prince of darkness. Daniel says this in the latter in Daniel 8, 23, in the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. Daniel 12, 10, many will be purged, purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. 
Revelation 9.21 says they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. All of these are going to be taking place in this seven year period. But trend number five, um, I want to leave on an encouraging note. Um, because Jesus uh, interjects two strong encouragements so that we don't lose heart. Uh, verses 13 and 14 of Matthew 24, he says this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So that tells us even during this time, the gospel is going to be preached. Uh, if we endure to the end, we'll be saved. A witness of the gospel will be given in every nation. And I see uh, the church in all her glory standing and fighting uh, by sharing the gospel, by not being silenced, by not being quieted. When, when Nazism overtook Germany, one of the things they did was they established the Church of Germany. And in establishing that church, churches were allowed to exist as long as they preached and taught what was approved by the Church of Germany. There were remnants of Christians, remnants of pastors who refused to do that and they started uh, underground offshoot churches. Uh, the Confessing Church uh, with Dietrich Bonhoeffer was during this time because they refused to comply uh, with what Nazism was saying the church could teach. Uh, we need to understand that we're going to have to stand in these days ahead. There are many rulings coming out against the church right now. Last week's rulings by the Supreme Court with regard to the employment uh, of those of the LGBTQ community. The decisions made this week about abortion and uh, saying that a state cannot set guidelines that are very, uh, very minimal but very necessary. These are just the beginnings. There's gonna come more and more. The fact that we in our churches um, were not allowed to gather and meet like they were in bars or like they were in protests. We just need to be awake and understand this, this is not a blip on the timeline of eternity. This is what Jesus told us was coming when the disciples asked, how are we gonna know it's the end? And Jesus told us about these signs so that we would be prepared. Not prepared to escape, not prepared to pack a suitcase because any minute we're gone, but prepared to stand, prepared to remain faithful to Him, to pray in what He's doing, to, to work with what He's doing, to not give in to evil, and to take this gospel of the kingdom in this day and this hour and still see many who are disillusioned. Many people are fearful because the ground they stand upon is being shaken. We stand, according to Hebrews, we stand upon a foundation that cannot be shaken. And we need to introduce them to that unshakable foundation. So before Jesus returns, I believe the Holy Spirit has raised up and is raising up uh, the greatest prayer movement in history. My wife and I founded this, this prayer ministry 15 years ago. Um, and our entire life is given to praying in uh, what God is doing in the final generation. To raise up young intercessors, older intercessors, to equip them, to send them out, to, to plant them in the nations, to pray in what God is doing in this day, in this hour. And right now, God is establishing night and day prayer watches globally. Um, there are over 10,000 prayer rooms. We're not talking churches. We're talking about places within cities set apart for one thing, to pray. In our city, our prayer room is set aside for anybody from any church to come in 
and to pray and to worship and to pray in what the Lord is doing. Together we are crying out for the salvation of Israel because we're told to do that. Together we are praying for our world leaders. We are praying for our president. And, and just let me be very clear, we have prayed for every president. We have not prayed for presidents based upon our political position or how we vote. We pray according to what God tells us to pray and how he tells us to pray for leaders. Pray exactly the same for Donald Trump as we prayed for Barack Obama, as we prayed for George Bush. Um, and so in the midst of all that, we need to know that we are crying out for the salvation of Israel. We are crying out for God's wisdom and God's will to come and to be done in this day and this hour. And for us to make certain that we do not get lost along the way and become some of those who will be deceived. Praying God's heart that every person be saved as Israel will be leading uh, the nation that God will use, Israel is the nation that God is going to use to fill the earth with his glory. Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Father, I ask that for everyone who's listened today, that they will pick up their Bibles, they will sit before you with Bible and pen and paper in hand, and Father, that they will ask your Holy Spirit, the greatest teacher, to teach them in these things. God, and to know this, that Jesus did not tell us of the dire days that were coming because he wanted us to be afraid. He told us of the difficult times, the persecutions and tribulations were coming so that we would be prepared, we would stand, we would have faith, and confidence in who we are in Him and who He's called us to be and what He has set for us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.